afternoon and welcome everyone to this special Concord Museum Forum where we mark and celebrate the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. The genesis of our invitation to Congressman Ro Khanna, who you will hear from in a moment, was an op-ed that he wrote with the late John Lewis after they both participated in a commemorative march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, a march that led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. John Lewis was, of course, a disciple of Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr., as the photo on the cover of his autobiography indicates, was a disciple of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi has written about how he took inspiration from Tolstoy in Concord's own Henry David Thoreau, who was famously imprisoned in the Concord Town Jail for protesting the spread of slavery in the United States. An incident that, in biographer Laura Walls' words, can be seen as, quote, a torch whose light would lead a hundred peaceful revolutions that still shape and shake the world. Our program today begins with a video filmed this summer of our curator, David Wood, explaining that signature moment in Thoreau's life in the historical context in which it occurred. I'm David Wood, curator of the Concord Museum, and we're here in the center of town in the Veterans Memorial, right by the Civil War Cenotaph. On the site of where the Middlesex Hotel stood right through the middle of the 19th century, and behind it, right about there, was the jail built in 1789. And that's the jail in which Henry Thoreau spent a night in 1846. He was staying at Walden at that time, came into town to get a shoe repaired here on the mill dam, and he was arrested for non-payment of taxes by the constable, Samuel Staples. Sam the jailer, as he was known, though I never call him Sam, Thoreau noted. He said of Staples that he was quick, clear, downright, on the whole a good fellow, especially good to treat with rougher and slower men than himself, always meaning well. Thoreau spent just one night in jail and was released when his aunt paid his back taxes. Being jailed in Concord is something of a tradition in the Thoreau family in that Henry Thoreau's great uncle Josiah was jailed just up the street at the, where the jail used to be located at the end of the graveyard there. Josiah Jones was arrested as a Tory uh, just after the outbreak of the beginning of the American Revolutionary War, jailed in Concord and was fed daily by his sister Mary because he was afraid that he would be poisoned. So strong was the sentiment against Tories at that moment. Secreted in the food that Mary Jones brought him were knives that he used to cut through the grate and so escaped from jail, finally made his way to Halifax. Both Henry Thoreau and his great uncle were released from their stays in jail by women in their family. Both of them were jailed on principle. Josiah Jones because he supported the established government, Henry Thoreau because he opposed the established government. Thank you for joining me. in which Thoreau remarked, quote, under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also in prison. Congressman Ro Khanna was elected to Congress in 2016. He represents California's 17th Congressional District, which is located in the Silicon Valley. He serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the United States Chamber of Commerce, Department of Commerce, for two years during the Obama administration. A native of Philadelphia, his parents are first-generation Americans, having emigrated from India where, as you will learn, Congressman Khanna's maternal grandfather fought alongside Gandhi 
and others to protest British rule. Immediately following the conversation with Congressman Khanna, my colleague Erica Loam, the Peggy M. Geary Curatorial Associate here at the Concord Museum, will share a few more words about the lock and key. Now let's listen to the conversation with Congressman Khanna. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here with Congressman Ro Khanna. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And as you know, we're going to air this program on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, I wanted to show you, I'm actually in our um, uh, one of our galleries, and this is uh, the lock and the key to the jail cell uh, that uh, when Thoreau was imprisoned for not paying his taxes. Uh, when wow. the jail came down, they saved the lock and the key. So again, for those who are watching, this is the key, and then you can see the uh, a hole there where the key would have gone in. But uh, I wanted to start, uh, we're gonna talk uh, again about Henry David Thoreau, or we're gonna talk about your grandfather, we're gonna talk about Martin Luther King, but I wanted to actually start on a somewhat somber note because this is the first Martin Luther King holiday uh, that we'll celebrate without your friend and colleague, Congressman John Lewis. Uh, and maybe you could just comment a word or two about your friendship and history with Congressman Lewis. Well, he is a, a giant uh, of American history, and he was the conscience of, of the Congress. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I was uh, close friends. I would say he was a, a mentor, as he was to so many uh, young members of Congress. And I had the great honor uh, of uh, going down with him uh, on one of his pilgrimages to, to Selma. He led one uh, every year where he would recount uh, the history of the civil rights movement uh, his own uh, struggles, but the, the broader movement. Uh, but he would be so forward looking. Uh, he would talk about uh, what this meant uh, for equality in our generation. And one of the things that struck me is he said, uh, Ro, there are a lot of issues, but you represent Silicon Valley and technology rights are the new civil rights. Uh, you need to be talking about technology equity. Uh, so he was a, a forward looking man uh, and uh, just a, a truly exceptional American. I should say my introduction to you was an op-ed that you and he co-wrote in the uh, Boston Globe, which uh, is what introduced me to this history that we're going to talk about. So uh, your family has its own connection with civil disobedience. So uh, tell us uh, the story of your grandfather. Well, my grandfather, Amarnath uh, Vidyalankar uh, was uh, part of uh, Gandhi's uh, independence movement uh, to uh, free India from uh, British colonialism. Uh, he was uh, part of that for over 15 years. Uh, he spent uh, time working for Lala Lajpat Rai, who was another figure in the Indian independence movement, uh, and then uh, was in jail uh, for uh, a period of almost four years during the Quit India movement, which was in the early 1940s, and uh, Gandhi's call to uh, uh, make sure that the British left uh, during the height of World War II. There was the hypocrisy of how can you be fighting for freedom around the world and still have colonial powers. And of course, after World War II, uh, both because of Gandhi's efforts and Roosevelt's efforts in our country, uh, in India was uh, finally free. And uh, my grandfather lived to, to see it free and then was part of the uh, very first uh, parliament that uh, India had uh, in, in its own democracy. And maybe tell us a little bit of the, uh, your parents' story. And uh, I'm interested if you met your grandfather, if you knew your grandfather. Well, my parents came here in uh, the uh, 1970s. My father came here to uh, study chemical engineering and uh, got a job at uh, with Roman Haas, which was a company in Philadelphia. Uh, and my mom and he settled down in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where they still are. Uh, I was born in uh, Philadelphia in 1976, or bicentenary, uh, and uh, grew up in in Bucks County as a, a young person. I had the chance a number of times to to visit India and met my uh, grandfather, uh, and uh, have early memories of him talking about uh, the independence movement, uh, playing chess with him. Uh, but my uh, he passed away when I was about nine, and uh, most of my uh, impressions of him are actually based on family lore because he was such a figure in uh, our family and so my grandmother and cousins and uncles would, would speak about him and uh, different uh, aspects of his life uh, uh, still do to, to this day. 
the op-ed that you wrote with Congressman Lewis talks about how uh, Gandhi found a copy of Thoreau's essay. Do you know much about how, uh, and, and do people in India uh, read Thoreau? Do you know if, uh, anyway, tell us more about Thoreau and Gandhi. Well, I don't know if people in India do. I know Gandhi did. He was a very uh, well uh, educated and well read uh, uh, a person. And, and both Thoreau and Tolstoy had uh, uh, enormous influences on uh, on his thinking. And of course, Thoreau was one of the uh, pioneers of this idea of uh, civil disobedience, uh, the idea that the uh, individual uh, in an individual of conscience uh, had a uh, a realm that was uh, apart from the state, that the uh, uh, the state couldn't force an individual uh, to do things that were uh, morally repugnant. Uh, this is why John Lewis talked about good trouble, that there were times where uh, individuals have to uh, resist uh, uh, oppressive laws of the state. And, and Gandhi, uh, from all accounts, was uh, influenced by, uh, by Thoreau. So you see the uh, seeds of uh, Thoreau and thinking uh, influenced, I would argue, with the with the Enlightenment, uh, making its way uh, in, into how Gandhi saw the world. Uh, it, of course, in 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 addition to Gandhi's own uh, faith, and uh, he was a avid reader of the Gita and Hinduism, an avid reader of the of the Christian Bible, and I think all of those sources influenced his worldview. And again, I'm not expecting you to be a historian, but uh, it's good to educate the public about these kind of cross currents of history because then uh, Martin Luther King himself was then inspired by Gandhi. Do you know uh, any bit of, of that story? Yes, well, uh, Dr. King, uh, there, there was a Reverend uh, uh, James Lawson, who we actually honored in the Congress uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, a few years ago and is still a, a alive and one of the real uh, unsung heroes of the civil rights movement was in India and learned uh, about uh, Satyagraha, which was Gandhi's call for nonviolence, and brought that teaching back to the United States. And he was one of the teachers of John Lewis uh, uh, in Tennessee, where he would uh, uh, offer classes uh, to John Lewis uh, and others about uh, nonviolent uh, uh, protest. And he also helped uh, bring some of that teaching to the uh, attention of Dr. King. And then, of course, uh, Dr. King visited India, and he said, uh, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, places he would go as a tourist, but to India he came as a pilgrim uh, and really uh, internalized and, uh, and, and paid respect to so much of, uh, of Gandhi's uh, work and teaching and uh, I think expanded upon that in, in his activism and involvement uh, in the United States. And uh, again, there's so much to talk about in terms of Dr. King and the various Civil Rights Act, but maybe go uh, tell us again about the commemoration and Selma and help explain how that march led to the Voting Rights Act um, in the mid 1960s. Well, that march was a, a critical march where John Lewis was actually famously beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And, uh, uh, you know, in my office hangs a picture with John Lewis on that on that bridge and our op-ed that we wrote together uh, signed by him. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, young men uh, uh, like John Lewis were willing and women were willing to march across that uh, bridge for uh, the sake of uh, uh, voting rights and to, to, to make sure that uh, uh, people in the South uh, and across the country would have uh, their right to vote guaranteed, that they couldn't be denied uh, based on pretext the, the, the right to vote. And he literally was, was beaten uh, for that. And then, of course, Dr. King, after uh, he was beaten when they wanted to complete the, the march, Dr. King went down there. And many people believe, uh, historians believe, that, that uh, the, the images of those students being beaten and them successfully completing the march is part of what inspired uh, the Voting Rights Act in, in this country. Uh, in the op-ed, you link the Voting Rights Act to the Immigration Reform Act of 1965, uh, which again was a landmark uh, piece of legislation signed by President Johnson that uh, really um, outlined uh, the uh, immigration system that we have today. But maybe, maybe you could uh, talk about how you almost see that Immigration Reform Act of 1965 as part of the larger civil rights movement. 
Well, I don't think we would have had the 1965 Immigration Reform Act if it weren't for the civil rights movement. It was the civil rights movement that uh, brought up uh, the idea that we should not be discriminating uh, against people from non-European countries and uh, that uh, uh, black and brown people uh, across the world had equal dignity. Uh, and many of the civil rights leaders, uh, including Dr. King, uh, spoke about that. And when you look at the debate in Congress, uh, the arguments uh, for restricting uh, immigration from non-European countries, uh, the arguments against that uh, were similar to the arguments of the civil rights movement. People said that was discriminatory, it was racist. And so the 65 Immigration Act basically opened this country up to immigration from non-European countries. I mean, there was a scattering, smattering of immigrants before that, but it was very, very small. And really most of the immigration from Asia uh, and other parts of the world uh, happened post uh, 65. Uh, and it, one of the uh, ironies of history is back then, uh, the family reunification provision was actually uh, advocated by people who uh, didn't want to dilute the European nature of America. And so they said, well, the, most of the people in America are European, and mm -hmm. so we should allow them to have their families come, and this will uh, make sure that the European influence of the America doesn't decline. And of course, today, it's people who are opposed to the more recent immigrants having their families come who have flipped on that. Uh, and again, I don't want to get too political or too policy oriented, but you are a leader of immigration reform. What are your thoughts about uh, again, the 1965 Act and what needs to be done today to improve our immigration system? Well, what we post 65 uh, really has led America down the, the path of becoming the first truly multiracial, multi ethnic democracy in the world. And it's quite extraordinary what we're trying to do. I mean, we're about 60% white. You compare that to Canada, which is nearly 80% white, or uh, Britain, 80% white, uh, Europe, Australia, 80% white, and you realize that there really has not been a multicultural, multiracial democracy in the in the history of the world. And uh, it's a true test of the uh, Lincoln founding or founding principle of what can you conceive of a nation, not on cultural identity, but on philosophical principles. So I think that there are two important uh, challenges for a nation. One is to articulate a common American narrative around principles that can uh, cut across uh, race and, and, and gender and religion and ethnicity uh, while allowing vibrant subcultures to thrive. And that's a very difficult challenge that I think explains part of the uh, toxicity and, uh, and, and uh, high stake battle in our politics. It's a, a hard project. Uh, and the second thing is uh, to make sure that we remain uh, open to uh, immigrants who have enriched this country. The economic studies show they've added uh, extraordinary economic benefits that they add far more uh, benefits than, uh, than take away because they not only are working but are consuming uh, products and, and increasing innovation and that we should recognize that contribution. Uh, so I, we can't end the interview without talking a little bit about the events of last week. And let's first talk about the positive ones in terms of, well, positive in terms of the Democratic side of the ledger in terms of the election in Georgia, uh, which again kind of gives fuel to this notion of a multi-ethnic uh, democracy. But um, as you know, Raphael Warnock, um, who is the uh, pastor at Martin Luther King's former church, it was the church I understand that John Lewis um, worshipped at when he was in Atlanta, uh, was elected. Maybe comment about uh, your perception of uh, that those election results in Georgia last week? Well, they were historic, especially uh, Senator Warnock, who is, uh, I, I think, the only second uh, uh, black member from the South uh, mm -hmm. uh, elected. And uh, just it's a, the beginnings of a new South. Stacey Abrams work there to register uh, black voters as a, a modern day completion or uh, or, or addition, I mean, the work is a complete addition to uh, what John Lewis did. And uh, Reverend Warnock, uh, Senator-elect War Warnock, uh, uh, represents a commitment to human rights, uh, a commitment to social and racial justice, and ran really proud of his convictions. And so for him to win Georgia on that platform uh, really suggests it's a, it's a new beginning uh, for that state. Uh, and then let's uh, talk about the very difficult um, uh, 
acts that occurred uh, last week. We're happy that you and I assume your staff are all safe, uh, uh, but uh, it, we're, we're gathered today to honor Martin Luther King, to talk about uh, John Lewis's legacy, again, the power of nonviolent protest, but that's not what we saw last week. Perhaps you, let you comment on that. Well, I think that's uh, exactly the distinction. It is the uh, both uh, Dr. King and, and, and John Lewis and Gandhi uh, emphasized nonviolence above all. And in fact, uh, Gandhi would call off protests as would Dr. King if they feared that it would lead to violence. Uh, nonviolence was a principle that uh, could not be compromised. Yesterday or last week, you had protests uh, that were armed uh, insurrection where you had people destroying property, uh, threatening human life, uh, plotting the assassination of, of political leaders. Uh, and that is a, a, an ugly uh, chapter in our, uh, our country's history. There is, of course, a, a, a healthy tension between uh, the reverence for the Constitution and rule of law that Lincoln spoke about, which was necessary to uh, keep a, a political, a liberal pol political uh, order thriving. And uh, Dr. King and, and, and John Lewis's uh, view that we need to protest and uh, in certain cases disobey laws that are, uh, are unjust. But where they both find common ground uh, is on the principle of nonviolence. And uh, we can have healthy debates about the balance between a reverence for a law and challenging the law, but there should be no room for debate uh, about whether violence is an acceptable means of change in a democracy. And our viewers might be uh, interested just how you experienced it personally. Were you in the chamber at the time or were you in your office? Or I was in, in my office in the Cannon Building, which we had to evacuate because there was a uh, pipe bomb at a car mm -hmm. located near the Cannon Office Building. We subsequently have learned that that bomb was intentionally placed there to distract the police so that the police would leave the Capitol uh, and the uh, invaders would be able to get into the Capitol. So I started to walk towards the Capitol because everyone was evacuating the cannon, cannon building. Fortunately, I got frantic texts uh, before I entered the building saying, the building has been overrun, head back to your office in Cannon. And uh, by then uh, we were fairly confident that the bomb threat had uh, been cleared. And so I went into my office, locked the doors and stayed there uh, for the duration of the day. Hmm. Uh, so my last question, it's again, Martin Luther King Day, and we hope to have a number of young people watching this program. What, what would be the message that you'd like to share with them on this uh, federal holiday? I would say that there are two things about uh, Dr. King that are worth uh, learning from and admiring. One is that he was a profound and deep thinker. Uh, Dr. King was someone who was uh, understood the American founding uh, arguably better than many of our founders. He understood, he had read Locke and he had read uh, Hobbes and he had read uh, so many of the Enlightenment thinkers. And so his words carried such weight because he framed his aspirations as furthering American ideals, as furthering American principles, as furthering uh, the best principles of uh, human civilization. And I think it's important to, to learn that lesson because uh, like Gandhi, uh, my view is often great leaders ground their arguments in the best of historical uh, traditions and national narratives instead of simply rejecting those narratives. And so I think uh, King in particular uh, is an example of how powerful that can be. And the second of course was uh, uh, his extraordinary courage, which we, uh, take uh, for granted. I mean, the incident that happened uh, to some of us at the Capitol that shook us up was an incident that was occurring in Dr. King's life almost on a weekly basis. It was not just that he happened to be uh, assassinated at the end of his life. Uh, one of the reasons he had such a premonition that uh, he wasn't going to live a long life uh, is uh, that he faced uh, uh, real threats of violence uh, on, on a daily, on a weekly basis, uh, and at, at huge risk to his life. And I think sometimes uh, we have a idealized image of uh, uh, his speeches inspiring a nation and uh, don't appreciate how much a risk people like him and uh, John Lewis put themselves through uh, to be able to secure the progress they did. 
Emerson Khan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we appreciate your uh, sharing these views uh, with us. If you're ever in Massachusetts and you have opportunity to come to Concord, we would love to welcome you here at our museum and give you a tour of our galleries. Well, thank you, Tom. I would love to do that after the pandemic. And thank you for uh, upholding a, a such an important part of American history, a, a tradition that I think uh, says far more about our country than the uh, nutcases who tried to storm the Capitol. That's uh, still a big minority. Right. Well, thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Lohm, the Peggy and Gary Curatorial Associate at the Concord Museum. In July of 1846, Henry David Thoreau spent a night in Concord's jail after refusing to pay his local taxes. This night in jail inspired his most influential essay, Civil Disobedience. In Civil Disobedience, Thoreau articulates the right of the individual to protest their government if their government is behaving in ways they believe to be unjust or immoral. And for Thoreau, this was particularly relevant since he was protesting the U.S. government's involvement in a territorial war with Mexico and the expansion of slavery. Both these themes made its way into civil disobedience, which continues to inspire countless activists today. Concord's jail was built in 1789 as Massachusetts moved its courts to Concord. And it was this lock and key that Thoreau himself saw when he was locked up for one night. This lock and key was made in Birmingham around the same time, 1789, made of fixed steel. Concord had its jail until 1871 when the courts moved to Lowell and the jail was demolished. Through this, Cummings Davis, our museum's founder, acquired the lock and key and it's been in our collection ever since. Now this lock and key helps to tell a couple of different stories. Of course, it tells the story of Thoreau and it tells Concord's local history but it also helps us to understand Concord as a site of anti-slavery activism in the 19th century, and it helps to expand the ideals that other artifacts in this gallery help to communicate. And this is an appropriate place for this lock and key because it resides alongside other artifacts from Concord's history, including artifacts related to April 19, 1775. And Thoreau took particular inspiration from the Minuteman who fought that day for their own freedoms against a corrupt government. And he saw himself as continuing that revolutionary tradition in the 19th century through his work protesting and through his writings. And today, civil disobedience stands as a testament to that legacy and continues to inspire generations of activists, including Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. And today, it helps us to understand how the ideas of liberty and justice and revolution are not something from the distant past but are alive and part of our fabric today. Let me conclude this afternoon's program with these words of Martin Luther King Jr. in which he invokes the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Six months before he died, Dr. King spoke to a group of middle school students in Philadelphia. Here is a brief excerpt from his talk. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is your life's blueprint? Whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint, and that blueprint serves as a pattern as a guide, and a building is not well erected without a good, solid blueprint. Now, each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives, and the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and sound blueprint. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture in 1871, quote, if a man can write a better book, or preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. 
Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best at whatever you are. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And please consider joining us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for a special inaugural Eve program that includes a film screening and panel discussion on the 1961 inaugural, which featured the first poet ever to do a reading. That poet was Robert Frost, who credited both Emerson and Thoreau as strong influences on his work. I wish you and our nation well on this important federal holiday where we pause to remember the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you so much for joining.